Good afternoon. Welcome to another UCSF Department of Medicine COVID Grand Rounds, uh, another in our series. Uh, we'll be talking about vaccines, attitudes toward vaccination, and the Biden uh, COVID task force today. You see um, the usual proclamations here. Uh, put your Zoom window in full screen mode. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. My colleague, Quinny Chang, is monitoring them. The session will be recorded. and and put on YouTube tonight at about 7.30. And if you're interested in closed captioning, uh, click show subtitles and that will uh, do that. We find ourselves at a uh, interesting and complex time in the pandemic. Uh, vaccines are out. Um, probably most healthcare workers, certainly most at UCSF have been uh, vaccinated and there are new ones that may soon become available with some new clinical trial results uh, coming out in the last week or so. Uh, hospitalization and case rates and test positivity rates are falling rapidly, although they still remain distressingly high, higher than they were during the prior surges. Uh, but because of the falling rates, uh, uh, we are beginning to open things up. Uh, sort of interesting, complicated question about whether we're doing it too soon, but obviously the pressures to do that are very real and, and understandable. And then we have this curveball of the variants of various types that are now being reported in the United States including uh, cases of the South African variant being reported in Northern California today. Uh, we also have some other challenges and one of them is uh, uh, disparities, which we've seen all through the pandemic in terms of cases and deaths. We're now beginning to see some of the disparities in vaccination that we had feared uh, with some evidence of uh, vaccine hesitancy coming from some of the surveys. So, uh, and also we're being challenged to think about our own individual behavior now with the curveball of some people being vaccinated and some people not being vaccinated. And we haven't gotten a ton of guidance about that yet, although just today the CDC announced that vaccinated people don't need to quarantine after an exposure. So we'll start seeing more of that as well. Uh, luckily, we have a new administration that is putting out uh, recommendations, uh, the CDC coming out with new stuff almost every, almost every day. And, um, and uh, recommendations about masking vaccination and the schools. So today we have a really rich multifaceted session to talk about a lot of this. And so we'll cover it quickly. Uh, first, we'll begin with Monica Gandhi, uh, who will review the new data on vaccines, including uh, three vaccines that have recently reported clinical trials data. Uh, Monica will also touch on the new CDC recommendations on masking, which uh, she had a, a substantial role and she's been uh, out ahead of the curve talking about uh, masking and whether we should change our practice. Uh, Monica, if I gave her, her you her whole CV, that would take the whole time, so I won't, but she's Professor of Medicine, Associate Division Chief of our Division of HIV, Infectious Disease and Global Medicine based at Zuckerberg, San Francisco General. She's also the Director of the UCS of Gladstone Center for AIDS Research and the Medical Director of the HIV Clinic Word 86 at San Francisco General. Uh, like many of our faculty, she focused on HIV prevention and treatment until a year ago and has pivoted to uh, becoming a real key opinion leader on some of the key issues in COVID. So uh, Monica will speak to us till about 1235, 1240 about uh, new, new data on vaccines as well as on masking. So Monica, thank you for being here. Uh, we'll then uh, pivot to uh, hearing from Margarita Lightfoot, who will discuss issues related to vaccine hesitancy and the ways we communicate about vaccines, particularly with communities of color. Margarita is Professor of Medicine, Chief of our Division of Prevention Sciences, and the, the, the Director of the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies uh, here at UCSF. Uh, she has also been interested in developing cost-effective approaches to, uh, to uh, work with communities uh, in health promotion, again, largely focused on HIV in the past, but has spent a lot of time thinking about these issues as they relate to COVID. So Margarita, thanks for being here. Margarita will be on about 1240 to 1250 or so. Then for the remainder of our time from 1250 to about 110, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, two members of, uh, of the Biden COVID task force. As you recall, one of the first things the president-elect Biden did was put together a task force of leading thinkers in, uh, in COVID. And uh, we were thrilled that of the 13 people on the task force, three of them were from, uh, from UCSF. We have two of them here today, uh, Drs. Robert Rodriguez and Eric Goosby. 
Eric uh, Roberts up first, so he's professor of medicine at UCSF, uh, excuse me, a press, professor of emergency medicine, although love to have you in our department, Robert, but professor of emergency medicine at UCSF. He's an active uh, emergency medicine uh, clinician. He's also led national research teams examining a range of topics in medicine, including importantly, the impact of COVID-19 on the mental health of frontline providers. He's also doing some interesting work on vaccination as it relates to the emergency department and patients seen there. Eric is professor of medicine in our department. Uh, Eric was the founding director of the Ryan White program in 1999 and worked in the Clinton administration to expand the program. He's had a variety of uh, major leadership roles in the country and in the world uh, around uh, HIV and other infectious diseases, including global AIDS coordinator under President Obama and uh, where he was uh, responsible for implementing the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. In 2015, he became the UN Special Envoy on Tuberculosis. And uh, along with uh, Robert and David Kessler from here, he was yet another member of uh, President Biden's COVID task force. So we will talk to, to Rob and Eric uh, toward the end of our time about that experience and a few other issues that relate to the pandemic. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started with uh, Monica Gandhi, who will talk to us about vaccinations and a little bit about masks. Monica. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm uh, going to try to be as quick as I can to get through some key data. So about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, so we are going to talk about how do the uh, COVID-19 vaccines that we currently have phase three clinical trial data work. Uh, I'm going to do a really short summary of the six trials for which we have phase three data, but then I'm only going to focus on the ones that are either in the United States or likely to come, which is Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson. I'm going to address, do vaccines decrease transmission? Do I have to worry about the variants? And that's when we'll bring in the questions about double masking. And then what can I do after vaccination and vaccine messaging? So again, we're gonna focus on just these top three, but these are the six candidates for which we actually have phase three clinical trial data, Moderna, Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, AstraZeneca, Novavax, and Sputnik. And I've given you the um, actual press release or the publications here so you can go and dig into them. We only have a press release on uh, two of them and the others have full peer reviewed publications. And so how do these vaccines work? So they actually all work, at least these ones, in the same way. They all have something to do with the spike protein. So here's the virus, here's the cell, and the spike protein is how you interface with the cell. There's also a receptor binding domain that end that's sticking into your receptor. And in some way, they either code for the mRNA, the DNA, or they involve an actual protein of this spike protein. Now we have, two mRNA vaccines. And the way this works is of course, the mRNA is like in this lipid bilayer and then it comes into your cell and then you yourself translate that mRNA into protein to which you raise antibodies in a T cell response and B cells. And then you create a very robust immune response. Amazing new technology. Second types are the adenovirus vaccines, which are AstraZeneca, Johnson & Johnson and Sputnik. And they have DNA inside them the endovirus is the vector that brings them in, and then the same process ends up happening. And then the sixth type is actually the protein itself combined with an adjuvant, and that is the Novavax vaccine. There are only two vaccines authorized here in the United States, Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech, but one is being reviewed for emergency use authorization by the FDA on February 26, a very important date uh, in my mind um, for lots of reasons, which, which I will explain. And this would be a one dose vaccine. Again, that adenovirus one, but one dose. Um, there is also one approved in the UK, India, the um, European Union, that's the AstraZeneca University of Oxford vaccine. And then there's two with recent phase three clinical data from two or so weeks ago, the Novavax and the Sputnik. So before we go into the clinical trials, I have to step back and remind you what vaccines should elicit in terms of an immune response. And really, um, they of course elicit antibodies. You hear a lot about antibodies, B cells, plasma cells making antibodies. But then remember that they elicit a robust T cell response. And the reason that that's so important is we think about T cells in two uh, types, CD4s and CD8s. And if you think about the CD4 type cells, there's Th1 CD4 cells and there's Th2. We want for a viral response, 
we want to favor a TH1 response. Thank you to Rachel Rudersauer who talked me through this yesterday, that we want a TH1 to TH2 ratio to be much higher for viruses. That ends up giving a robust vaccine uh, viral uh, mediated response. And um, TH2 is not good because it can block actually the CD8s and the TH1 CD4s. So think about the T cells, remember the T cells, we're gonna keep on coming back to the T cells. Okay, this is where I get to talk just briefly about the other three, but I'm going to just do a quick summary. And this will now set the stage for the rest of the talk. The Moderna I already told you is on the top. It's an mRNA vaccine. It's two doses. And if you look at its immunogenicity data, it did indeed stimulate neutralizing antibodies, a strong Th1, CD4, and CD8 cell response. And if you gave it to macaques, it protected from rechallenge. In the vaccine, in the trial, fifteen thousand people got the vaccine, and. Um, of those who were hospitalized, it was 97% effective, and it was 97% effective for severe disease. Actually, the New England Journal paper reported 30 cases of severe disease in the placebo and zero in the vaccine arm. In retrospect, when, when the FDA was looking back, there was one case in the vaccine arm after the first dose who likely was hospitalized with COVID. So let's classify that as a severe case, 90%, 7% efficacy in severe disease and 94% in mild to moderate. Pfizer mRNA vaccine, two doses, same wonderful immune responses, 18,600 in those who got the vaccine, 100% against either hospitalization or severe disease, 100% effective, 95% if you add in milder disease. Johnson & Johnson is a human adenovirus with DNA, one dose, two dose trials ongoing, but one dose. Um, and again, it is um, stimulated all the right responses, protected against macaques, 22,000 people studied in the US, Latin America, South Africa, 100% efficacy against hospitalizations. They don't give us the actual numbers. It's just a press release. 85% protection against severe disease across all three sites. Actually, 89% protective in South Africa, where 95% of the strains were the 501Y V2 South Africa variant. Keep that in mind when we worry about these two cases in the Bay Area. And then efficacy against milder disease was more disparate. 72% uh, in the US and 57% in South Africa where the variant was circulating. AstraZeneca, which I won't be able to go over in detail, um, is uh, a chimp adenovirus with DNA, two doses, lovely immune responses, protection from rechallenge in macaques, over 85, 88 in the, uh, who got vaccine in the trials to date. We just have a phase three in the UK, phase two B in South Africa. 100%, you keep on seeing this theme, 100% protective against severe disease. Yes, there was variability in responses for milder disease. And in fact, the South Africa trial was halted uh, for um, not protecting against mild disease. But again, and these are published, peer reviewed, published in Lancet, 100% protective against severe. Novavax, um, also uh, good immune responses. We, uh, we have a couple of just, this is just a press release. We'd like to see more data. 100% protective against severe disease, but to be fair, there was only one case of severe disease in the placebo. And then it was also disparate in terms of milder disease outcomes with the South Africa variant. And then Sputnik finally um, is a two dose vaccine, actually has two adenoviruses in it. And uh, it produces good immune responses. This was a little weirder how to study it. And then it was also 100% effective against severe disease, 20 in placebo, zero in vaccine. You're seeing a theme. So why are T cells so important to come back to this? Why, are, why do I keep on talking about severe disease? Because there is lots and lots of data that essentially T cell responses modulate severity of disease. In fact, strong T cell responses were documented in all six of these trials. It likely led to this prevention of severe disease. And even prior to the time we got vaccines, you saw all this data running around about, did we have cross T cell immunity to other coronaviruses that ended up leading to more mild SARS-CoV-2 infections in those of us who had that immunity, um, indicating places like India, for example. If you get reinfected after natural infection or vaccine, um, it should be milder if you mounted a good T cell response. And a very fun fact is that this study from um, uh, the in 1918 influenza pandemic, they actually took 90 year olds who were three years old by when they were 
got infected with influenza and 90 years later, their memory B cells were happily able to stimulate a neutralizing antibody to the influenza. So think about long-term control as cell mediated. Okay, let's dig down a little bit more into the, um, into the uh, trials that you need to know about. Um, Sorry, I'm just getting my phone. Okay, <laughs> take a look at the time. Um, and I wanna, I wanna give you a little more detail on the trials that you find important um, in this audience, at least because these are the ones that are either authorized or about to possibly be authorized in the United States. Let's start with the Pfizer-BioNTech trial. The demographics, um, I hear, I see a lot of talk about, oh, this wasn't, a, we didn't enroll enough, there wasn't enough diversity, there wasn't enough old people. I actually want to give you the numbers because I think it was likely as good as it gets for a vaccine trial because you actually had to be at risk for infection to be enrolled in these trials, right? These were not challenge trials, that would be unethical. We are actually hoping that people will have be sort of out there and be working and possibly be exposed so that we can see cases and to see if the vaccine will decrease um, uh, will we'll create prevention. So there were 43,448 people enrolled in the trial, two shots, 30 micrograms, three weeks apart. Many of you have had this in this audience. Um, of the ones reported in the New England Journal article, actually 40, 50% were female. 82.9% were white, I admit that's high, but at least there was 28% uh, Latinx community uh, participants in this, 9.83% African-American. 21.4% were over 65 years, which was helpful. 42.2% were over 55. And there was a lot of comorbidities. Obesity was actually 35.1% in this trial, some diabetes and pulmonary disease. And in terms of the efficacy, this is a figure that you're now familiar with, this incredible, incredible, not thinking we were gonna see such high efficacy for symptomatic disease. Outcome, importantly, symptomatic COVID. You had to say you didn't feel well, and then you got swabbed. Not weekly swabbing to see if you had asymptomatic COVID. But of the 170 who became infected with COVID, 162 in the placebo arm, eight in the vaccine arm, 95% effective. And that was the same level across older people and those who had comorbidities. Again, I already told you the severe disease, all nine in the placebo group, zero in the vaccine group. There was a misclassification of one. Um, there were no serious safety concerns observed. There was, and for those of you who've had it, some 83% injection site reactions. Um, and the only grade three adverse event greater than 2% in frequency was fatigue and headache. Uh, the problem is, and we're quite familiar with this at this point, negative 70 degree freezers are required. It actually comes with a lot of dry ice in this packaging, but it really can't even sit in the fridge, uh, the regular fridge of two to eight degrees. And that is a logistical barrier for this particular vaccine. The real world data on the Pfizer um, uh, vaccine is bearing out exactly what we see in trials, which is always lovely to see the real world data mirror the trial data. There was a study uh, that is tantalizingly hinted at in Bloomberg yesterday from the UK that in a couple of days we're going to get some data from the United Kingdom that single dose of Pfizer shot gave two thirds protection. The data suggested Israel had a deal with Pfizer that they're rolling only out Pfizer and they're rolling it out quickly. And uh, this is a study in, in MedArchive that of 300,000 more people in Israel um, immunized after the first dose, there was a 51% efficacy actually for both asymptomatic and symptomatic infection. So that is exactly what was seen in the trial. So it's lovely to see this efficacy mirror effectiveness. And then let's go to the Moderna vaccine. This is also a large trial. Oh, I should have mentioned Pfizer is over 16, Moderna is over 18. Two shots, four weeks apart. Uh, also uh, about 50-50 female. 25% were over 65 years old, 36.5% were from communities of color, and 82% again had to have high occupational risks, including quite a bit of um, healthcare workers. And then there was a fair amount of comorbidities as can be seen in the table. The efficacy mirrors that of Pfizer, 196 final, final total symptomatic infections against symptomatic disease, and it was a 94.1% efficacy. Of the 30 cases of severe disease, all of them occurred in the placebo. However, there was one person in the vaccine group that got hospitalized, PCR negative, then PCR again, and it was COVID positive. So likely that was a hospitalized patient after the first dose in the vaccine group. In terms of safety, you can see the local reactions are actually quite 
heightened, um, quite high uh, up in the 90s, and then a little more of the adverse effects with headache, fatigue, and myalgias and arthralgias, quite high amounts, a uh, greater than 2% with grade three. There's an advantage of this vaccine with the mRNA uh, stability is that it can be stored in the fridge, which is a regular fridge for 30 days. And then um, it didn't, uh, wasn't designed to swab weekly, but there was a swab that occurred right before the second dose. And uh, it likely, it, it reduced, there was a relative risk reduction of 62% for asymptomatic infection, as well as what I already told you for symptomatic. And then I'm going to end on the Johnson & Johnson because um, this is something that, again, I told you the FDA uh, EUA has been filed, and I think we're going to hear uh, as soon as February 26. Uh, the demographics, uh, this is, I really need to hasten to say this is only in press release form, so I don't have some details like we did have on the Moderna and Pfizer. There were... Um, 44,000 participants. It was in the US, it was in Latin America, including Brazil, and 15% were in South Africa. 45% female, 34% were over 60 years old, and also more diversity than we've seen in a lot of things, 59% white, but 45% Latinx um, or Hispanic, and then 19% African American. 41% in this had comorbidities, um, including obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And in this case, there were more outcomes than in the other two. It was a large trial, four and uh, very varied, 468 cases of symptomatic COVID, 100% effective against hospitalizations and deaths, common theme, and then 85% effective against severe disease, which actually included that subset of hospitalizations and deaths. The CEO of J&J gave some data that in South Africa itself was 89% effective against severe disease. And um, in South Africa, 95% of the strains were this variant, uh, the B1351. It was seven, it, the, the um, effectiveness against moderate disease was varied. 72% in the US, 57% in South Africa, 66% in Latin America. In terms of adverse effects, a little more fever, um, at least low grade, 9%, but there was no mention of injection site reactions. And interestingly, the overall severe adverse effects were higher in the placebo than in the vaccine arm. And one dose clearly will have major implications for hastening rollout. Even after one dose, the immunogenicity seems to keep on giving and giving and giving as, um, as seen by the uh, New England Journal uh, immunogenicity paper. So we expect more efficacy even after the 14 to 28 days that were looked at in the Johnson & Johnson trial. I'm really hoping for this February 26th meeting. And then I'm going to end because you've heard a lot about AstraZeneca, about some good and bad. And then we're going to go to the next part of the talk. The AstraZeneca has not been um, filed for or approved in the U.S. The U.S. trial is actually finishing up. However, it is approved in many regions of the world, as I told you. It is cheaper. It is not as fragile as mRNA vaccines. They did do weekly cell swabs and saw a decrease in asymptomatic infection as well. And you can give two doses 12 weeks apart. In fact, the immunogenicity was actually increased the longer duration you had between doses. That's a good thing. That means that's how the UK approved it. And that could have implications for um, uh, Bob's theory about the one dose with Moderna and Pfizer duration and then giving the two dose a little longer. Bad things, um, it was strange. Some people got a half dose and then a full dose and it was apparently a mistake and it was only people less than 55 and the EU didn't even approve it for greater than 65. Those are all confusing. And the trial, as I pointed out before, was halted in South Africa because it wasn't protective against mild disease, but luckily 100,000 healthcare workers um, are actually still in a different type of trial there and severe disease, at least by all accounts, are likely to be prevented. Okay, let's turn to the last three topics. Do vaccines decrease transmission? Um, I uh, think that they are going to, and there are four excellent biological plausibility reasons why vaccines are gonna decrease transmission. What do I mean by transmission? Well, of course, their symptomatic disease, that was the main outcome for all of the clinical trials that I just went over, including the Sputnik and Novavax. Um, but there's also asymptomatic infection and asymptomatic infection means you have nasal colonization of the virus and you could possibly pass it on to someone else. So what are the ideas that you could not really prevent transmission? The idea is will it prevent nasal carriage essentially, which would then be the mechanism by which asymptomatic infection occurs for main reasons. 
One is that the trials all measured IgG antibodies um, and IgG antibodies very happily go into the nasal mucosa. So um, systemic vaccination uh, leading to IgG antibodies, those penetrate into the nasal mucosa. Second, systemic vaccines do elicit IgA immunoglobulins. They weren't measured in these trials, but this has been shown in many other studies of vaccines. And uh, thus, IgA is probably likely to be present to help us with our nasal mucosa. Third, this is a New England Journal study on the bottom, monoclonal antibodies hasten viral clearance from the airways. So if the antibodies do it monoclonal form, why wouldn't the polyclonal antibodies from vaccines do it? And then number four, um, if you went, I told you that there were challenge experiments in macaques uh, that were done with all of these vaccines or many of them. And in those macaque studies, if you swabbed the lower airways, did a BAL and then swabbed the upper airways, you after vaccine, you saw no um, viral RNA or very low viral RNA in macaques in the nasal swabs. So all great biological plausibility reasons for this. Again, wasn't studied in the trial. However, we have some real world data. I told you that Pfizer is uh, working uh, with Israel. So there is quick sort of every other twice a week data coming out of Israel. This is the um, this is the website below if you want to look at it. 90% of those over 60 are vaccinated in Israel. And the case rate in those over 60 year olds are, is very low. You can see that on the right side um, over here. And of course, the hospitalizations have gone down as we expect because of this reduction in severe disease. In the younger individuals, we only, they only have 37% coverage and the cases are still there, though they're coming down. And then the hospitalizations uh, are still there. Again, much lower coverage in that younger group. And then finally, um, I do wanna point out this really nice study. I think this, is, uh, this was a study out of Catalonia, Spain that was published in The Lancet last week that the viral load in the nasal mucosa is, be, is a main driver of transmission. It's actually four times lower transmission essentially with a lower viral load. And then this is a paper from just posted this morning in MedArchive um, from the Pfizer data in Israel that there's four times less viral load in the nose after vaccination. So this put together um, means that we're gonna have lower viral loads in our nose. And then finally, vaccines don't need to completely stop COVID-19 transmission to curb the pandemic. And I urge you to read the Scientific American article to understand that premise. And then finally, I will end that a ID doctor that will remain nameless in Boston said to me yesterday, it take a special kind of pessimism of someone to think that vaccines will not decrease transmission. Okay, now let's just mention the variants and then that's where we can get into masking. So um, do I need to worry about the variants? That's actually my, my lesson because you've talked about the variants in this, in this meeting before. Um, so let's put it really simply. Of course, these have a number of mutations. Let's just make it simple. This is the CDC reporting as of this morning of uh, at least the number of quote, the UK variant, which is B117, 932 cases out of 34 states in the US. The B1351, um, there are nine cases supposedly, and we had two in the Bay Area yesterday. And then the Brazil variant, which is P1, um, very low numbers here, at least what's been reported. We had to do genomic sequencing. And then the California variant that Dr. Chu is working on. Um, so, you know, the good thing is that at least with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines, against the ones that are actually approved, right, authorized in the United States, um, there has been this, I'm just showing you the nature paper from Pfizer, but similar um, data is elicited from uh, Moderna, that there are very high neutralizing antibody titers against all of these variants. Yes, they're slightly lower, but they're way higher than what you would need um, to neutralize virus. And again, remember the T cells. Um, and then in terms of the specific Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine that we're hoping to get authorized on February 26th, I already gave you the data, but I want to pull out this quote from something Dr. Warner Green said yesterday, a couple of days ago, which is even with the South Africa variant uh, and the Johnson Johnson one dose vaccine protects you from severe disease, having to go to the hospital and dying. And frankly, that's what we want from a vaccine. That's fantastic. You may have to have a runny nose or a mild upper respiratory tract infection, but you're not going to develop life-threatening pneumonia and require hospitalization. And I'd sign up for that vaccine any day. And so would I. 
Um, why do I say that severe disease matters? Why do I talk about T cells so much? This is a really nice article from Cell Medicine last week um, that against natural infection and the same is expected from vaccines, that there's a very broad T cell repertoire elicited, like at least 19 epitopes, probably more against CD4 cells, 17 uh, with CD8 cells after infections. This means that viral escape after you've mounted a good T cell response is going to be very difficult. And if you get reinfected, it's likely to be very mild. And in fact, you may not notice it at all. So this is my summary of why not to worry about vax variants. This is what RNA viruses do. They actually mutate less than DNA viruses, uh, more than DNA viruses, but SARS-CoV-2 mutates less than influenza. We've just had a lot of transmissibility these days. It's transmitting. Uh, we, it doesn't mutate that fast. Uh, neutralizing antibody titer information from Moderna and Pfizer is comforting. And we've talked a lot about T cell responses and how comforting that is against these variants. mRNA vaccines and DNA vaccines can be easily tweaked. You don't have to even work with live virus, with live SARS-CoV-2. You change what you put in there. You can even put a couple of uh, uh, variants in there and you can do a booster shot in the future. There e Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca have already promised to start working on these and are working on these. So try not to worry about the variants. And then, uh, and then finally, I wanna mention masks. Why do we wanna tamp down transmission right now? Uh, Bob said at the beginning of this talk that um, we do wanna tamp down transmission. Obviously, as Dr. Fauci says, um, viruses can't mutate if they don't replicate. And this is a nice model from uh, Rochelle Walensky, who is Dr. Walensky, who's now the CDC director, that really you want to bring down transmission. You don't want to be rolling out vaccine when you have high levels of transmission. By the way, usually we get a vaccine after a pandemic has calmed down. Um, and so I want to point out about, say, one thing about masking. Um, this is a paper that's coming out in Lancet ID. Uh, where Dr. Uh, Matt Spinelli is the first author and our group, uh, Dr. Uh, Goosby as well, where we uh, postulate the complementary non-pharmaceutical interventional triangle, which is the idea is that if you have more ventilation, then you can have less masking. If you, uh, when you're outside, for example, if you're more crowded, you may want a higher level filtration fit mask because then you uh, don't have your advantage of ventilation or distancing. And so they complement each other. And so what did the CDC say yesterday about double masking? Um, well, this is going to be my first introduction to you about tiered messaging. It's not just one thing for everything. This does not need to be done outside. You have the advantage of ventilation outside. You can use a simple cloth mask if you're around people. By the way, if you're alone, you don't need to have a mask, but um, simple cloth mask or surgical mask outside. But if you're indoors and we wanna tamp down transmissibility, the idea is to increase fit and filtration of your mask. And there are four ways to do it, it's quite simple. One's an N95, which I think is uncomfortable. Second is a surgical plus cloth because it brings it closer to your face and increases fit. And it also has two layers of filtering. Surgical blocks electrostatically, cloth blocks in a different way. Um, third is they call knot and tuck, which I find challenging, but you like knot and tuck the surgical mask. Um, and then the fourth, and I actually think this is the easiest, is those cloth masks with a filter in them. Um, you can buy them on many sites and it's a cloth with a filter and you have that blocking from two different materials. And that's what I would recommend for indoor spaces um, during this uh, latest surge. And then finally, what can I do after vaccination and vaccine messaging? I think that we need to, again, go back to the idea of tiered messaging. We don't have to say one size fit all. We don't have to say everyone stay home uh, when essential workers uh, couldn't stay home. We can say if that, then this. And Dr. Fauci said this this morning on the Today Show, so I'm bold enough to tell you my suggestions for the tiered approach. Vaccinated and vaccinated, feel free to mingle each other with each other without restrictions. Dinner parties, um, vaccinated healthcare workers sitting around a table and doing rounds. Vaccinated around unvaccinated in the public, keep your masks and distancing on. Tiny chance of transmission, again, the data is pointing otherwise, but let's keep it safe and uh, keep our masks on around the unvaccinated. Unvaccinated and unvaccinated, keep all our usual restrictions. It is important to message with optimism. As Dr. Fauci said this morning on the Today Show, public is savvy enough to understand tiered messaging 
You don't have to give an inch and think that we're going to take a mile. The public can be trusted. And remember, lessons from HIV. We Sarah sorted with HIV. We can back sort at this time. And I will end there and say that I think that the, I would like to see all of us doing this, that Europe has a better messaging. Dr. Vinay Prashad and uh, Julia Marcus have been talking about this, but here is a health officer saying, I do this so I can hang out and get a big family weekend get together. And we say mass and distance forever. I think it's important to message with optimism and all in there. Thank you. Monica, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Why don't you take down your slides if you can? Yes. Ooh, I, yeah, that's good. <laughs> Thank you. That was fantastic. Uh, we have about five minutes, so let's go ahead and almost a lightning round. Uh, vaccines and pregnancy. Yes. Um, I think vaccines and pregnancy, the mRNA vaccines are very safe. Why? Because there's no biological reason to think they wouldn't be. The mRNA degrades really quickly, goes away from your body, won't uh, go to the fetus. And it's pregnancy and COVID, uh, people can have worse outcomes. So I would really recommend, and I think many OBGYN bodies have said the same vaccination during pregnancy. You actually can get those nice antibodies to your baby. Um, so I would recommend it. Okay. Uh, it's sort of putting aside the idea of maybe having to retool for a variant. Uh, just what do we know about the, the length of uh, a vaccine effectiveness right now? Yeah, that's a great question. There was a study from UCSD, Dr. Jennifer Dan in science that indicated at least after natural infection that B cells and T cells, the way their half-lives were looking, they were either like on a path to either lifelong immunity or at least 10 years. So it was just sort of measuring the half-lives. So I think we're gonna have long lasting immunity from these vaccines. Just like I said, the influenza vaccine, they had 90 year immunity. We just change it because the variant, you know, there's variations of the influenza vaccine. But what I got 10 years ago is still in my memory B cells for influenza vaccine. So I think we're gonna get along and everything will depend on the variants. Okay. Um, so what kind of masks are you, well, you're vaccinated now, so it might change it. But when you, when you do wear a mask, I have to say the knot and tuck, I, it would probably take me six months to figure out how to do that. So that's not an option. What are you doing? Yeah, so I'm spatially challenged and I'm not a surgeon for a reason. I totally agree. I cannot, I don't know what they're talking about with not in touch. So um, I, I liked the, the cloth with the filter inside because I think it's the most lightweight option. And that's what I'm having my parents do or between first and second doses now in indoor spaces. I am vaccinated, so I wear the simple cloth mask. Great. Some tantalizing data in the last week or two that says if you've had prior COVID, maybe your first dose is the equivalent of a booster and you don't need a second. What do you think about that? Excellent, excellent point, because this was with um, the Moderna vaccine that after even just one dose, if you had had COVID before, you had tenfold the neutralizing antibodies than you did if someone got two doses. And in fact, someone wrote me and said they had such a severe reaction with their first dose after having COVID just two weeks earlier, that I think that's a very tantalizing option for if you've had COVID just doing one dose. Ready for prime time, wait for the CDC, wait for the FDA, what are we- Advertisement, talking? COVID digest uh, coming out on Friday from the ID group will review that paper. And then um, it's only a med archive paper, but I think once we wait for the peer review, I think it could be ready for time time. I really liked your one dose commentary in Washington Post. I thought it was really important. And it's 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 sort of along this theme. Uh, you meant well, just delay, separate, that's what you meant. Yeah, sec separate issue. I mean, one, one issue is if you've had prior COVID, you need the second dose. Yeah. The argument that I made with Shisha Shah was, was the- Separating, the Long, question, longer duration. Should we, should we delay people's second doses in order to get more people their first dose sooner? Now more data's come out from Israel and elsewhere. What right. do you think about that idea today? I liked your idea from the beginning and I like it today because of the Israel data. Um, like you said, the UK said after one dose, 67% efficacy, amazing. That was better than the, than the trials, even though we really couldn't tell because it was 52%, but we gave it the second dose so fast. So getting the population immunized more quickly with the one dose and then you do the second dose when you can, I really, applaud that. And Dr. Um, Podkin wrote a really great um, article on this in CID last week. Okay, we'll see See if that happens. Um, the uh, the J&J, &J, if you had a chance to get it today and you were told you could get Pfizer and Moderna in a month, what would you do? I would get the J&J. &J. I am so excited, like Dr. Green, about the uh, reduction of severe disease, the one dose, the um, I can get, a, if I need, if I go somewhere and I need a variant boost in the future, fine, but I am, I love this vaccine. I really do. Okay. 
uh, Monica, that is an immense amount of information you covered in a short period of time. And we're grateful to you for that and, and, and the really terrific work you've been doing throughout the pandemic. So thank you. thank you. Look forward to having you back again in the future and keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Let us move on uh, to Margarita. And um, uh, Margarita's going to talk to us a little bit about issues around vaccine hesitancy and maybe a particular focus on communities of color. And uh, I'm going to just give you the floor for the first five minutes or so and riff about those issues and maybe some of the things from what you've heard from Monica, how that changes uh, changes our thinking as we have, have, have we been too much of a downer about these vaccines or looking at all the bad stuff. And the presentation she just gave us, if, if she gave us that presentation in October, we would have said, you know, what what is she smoking? I mean, that's that that <laughs> it's remarkable <laughs> that we have these vaccines and they are this effective and this safe. So let me give you the floor for a few minutes and just talk us through what you're thinking about this. Thanks, Bob. And that was incredible, Monica. Thank you so much. So with all of that, one has to wonder why are people hesitant about taking the vaccine and what can we do about it? So as a social behavioral scientist, a psychologist, that's one of my primary questions and really is foundational to understanding what we need to do to help folks get over the hesitancy they have about the vaccine. We know that humans are not always rational, but usually there's a reason why we engage in the behavior that we're doing. We're talking about human behavior. So, but there's a robust literature that can guide us around how to help folks think about this vaccine to get over their hesitancy. So why are folks hesitant? We have to realize that hesitancy is really rooted in a social, cultural, political, religious context. So the context that people live in. And when we talk about addressing the vaccine, particularly for those, for those populations that have been disproportionately impacted, we need to think about that. So I'm sure most of you saw the AP poll results from, uh, that were released yesterday, where there was a third of US uh, adults were skeptical of COVID vaccines. And why are they skeptical? They're worried about safety. They're worried about possible side effects. They're worried about questions around, or they're worried about the effectiveness against the new variants. And and that's just overall, but we also need to think about really specific concerns that communities have and be able to address those as well. So I recently, for example, I recently spoke at a community forum um, that was mostly African-Americans and someone asked a very reasonable question. Hank Aaron had died the week before and he had gotten, he had just gotten the COVID vaccine the week before. The question was, were those two things related? A really uh, thoughtful question that made sense. And so we need to also address the questions that these communities are having. He was 86 years old. That's probably why he died uh, the, in terms of the, his health condition, not because of the COVID vaccine, but we need to be able to talk to folks about those things. So the question is, after all of what Monica just said in terms of side effects, safety, why do these concerns still exist? And I think it's probably because we haven't employed the proven evidence-based principles on how we talk and message when it comes to this vaccination. So one thing that we know is providing information is not enough. Providing research findings while necessary isn't enough. People need to know more. So what are some of these evidence-based strategies? Well, one, we need to realize that communication is a two-way process. There's the telling and then there's the listening. We've been doing a lot of telling, telling people what to do, telling people the vaccine is safe. We haven't done enough listening to really understand what it is that that keeps people from wanting to be to take the vaccine that keeps them from being hesitant and that keeps them as hesitant so rec let's recognize that people have good reason to be hesitant and they're using and this idea of using stigmatizing language to characterize those folks really isn't helpful the folks who are hesitant there are, are healthcare workers we know that not every healthcare work healthcare workers have there have been some who've been resistant who've wanted to not take the vaccine right away hesitancy is people who, are, who have college degrees, as well as those who are, have historical and contemporary reasons for not trusting a vaccine. So we often talk about Tuskegee. Tuskegee ended in 1972. So today's 75 year olds were 26 years old when Tuskegee ended. That's not a long, that's not a long time ago in their lifetime. For folks, for Latinx communities, stories of being passed down through families about the atrocities and the Guatemala studies, these aren't things that happened a long time ago. And so we need to be thinking about that as we're messaging. So let's talk about the message. Who's the right messenger? It's got to be someone that the communities uh, trust, that they like, and they feel like is working 
towards the same goal, who has their best, their health and best interests in mind. I recently did a focus group with youth who are experiencing homelessness. It's mostly young people of color. And while we all think that Dr. Fauci is, is the person who we all listen to for information, these young people uh, didn't trust Dr. Fauci. They thought that he was out for their fame. Now, I'm not going to make it. That's not any commentary. I'm just reporting what, what they were saying. But the idea is that we have to really be, the messenger has to be someone that the community that you're talking to and wanting to have an impact uh, can, can hear and that they trust. So how do you get that? There needs to be involvement of community leaders. We know there's a lot of literature that supports that. Social mobilization and community engagement, particularly in communities of color, is going to be key. We need to also potentially be talking about what, what kind of training and communication tools do providers and healthcare workers need so that they can message in a way that's going to be acceptable to people. We have a really good example of this right here in our own backyard, this, this idea of doing community, talking with community leaders, community engagement, and the work of uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Diane Havler in her partnership with Latino, the Latino Task Force. They were able to talk to over 4,500 people predominantly low-income Latinx populations, 86% of those folks were interested and willing to get the vaccine. And half of those who were willing to get the vaccine had no primary provider or insurance. So because of the partnership, because of the collaboration, because of the messaging coming from people from the community that they trusted, they were, they're able to really connect and have folks being willing and overcome any hesitancy when it comes to the vaccine. Now, I'm not talking about access, but this also speaks to the need for multiple entry points in and outside of the healthcare system to make the, vac the vaccine available. So the second thing was really the right messenger. The third thing is the message itself. Messages need to resonate and be respectful. They have to recognize people's lived experiences and the reasons why they're not taking the vaccine, as I've kind of addressed before. So our, our messages around the vaccine really need to talk about how was it approved so fast? What, what about the side effects? All those folks who are taking a wait and see approach, we're not going to get to them until we talk to them about the things that they're worried about. Just what we've heard from Monica, the messages about the vaccine really should be about the, the vaccine works, even against the variants. Right now, most of what's discussed is what is being discussed is about the variants. So of course, there's gonna be a lot of hesitancy around whether or not these vaccines are really uh, eff efficacious. Messages about safety and scientific integrity and the fact that they weren't compromised need to be at the forefront of what we talk about. And then the last thing has been in terms of a successful strategy is the use of incentives and rewards. Now I'm not talking about paying people to get the vaccine, but a reward for getting the vaccine is you don't have to wear a mask. A reward for getting the vaccine is you're being able to, as Monica said, you can have dinner with someone who also is vaccinated, dinner with a loved one. Those are the kinds of things, those are the kinds of incentives and rewards for taking the vaccine that will motivate people to go ahead and do that. Plus just the relief. Most, a lot of my colleagues have gotten the vaccine and I see them posting on my Facebook how relieved they are, they're congratulating each other. That's the kind of thing that we need to be able to convey to others who have yet to take the vaccine. It should be focusing on all the things that Monica said, we have a lot of reasons to be um, optimistic and particularly with communities of color, we need to partner with them and we need to understand what are the other barriers that folks are having and address those directly. So that's my current thinking about it, Bob. Great, thank you so much, that was, that was terrific. Uh, when you see uh, the data are, are pretty limited so far, but we are beginning to get data that shows that we have lower vaccine uptake in, uh, in communities of color, maybe particularly in black communities. Is your, is your sense that that is mostly about hesitancy and choice or your sense is that's mostly about access and barriers, uh, which I know you didn't get into, but it, it's, as yeah. I see those data, I'm trying to figure out which one it is because they would have different solution sets. Absolutely. I think it's a, a little bit of both. So there's definitely data that suggests that folks are hesitant, that they're worried about the vaccine, they're worried about the safety issues. Um, but also, just given what uh, the experience of Dr. Havler, access is absolutely going to be an issue because population, uh, Black folks, Latinx folks, they're less likely to have insurance, they're less likely to have a primary care person, so they're not going to be able to access the vaccine in more traditional ways, or at least the ways that we're currently rolling them out, which really speaks to the need to have 
focused uh, neighborhood type of vaccination sites in the places where people live and work. Yeah. And you mentioned the idea of incentives and that in some ways the incentive of getting your life back maybe could and should be enough, but uh, there's probably going to be more and more discussion over time, probably not so much about paying people, but about um, immunity passports and you can get into the stadium if you're vaccinated or, or tra certain kinds of travel. And if you can't, do you think that's good? Do you think that's a bad? Do you worry about its differential impact in communities of color if we start making access to certain parts of life dependent on vaccination? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. I think uh, th there's definitely incentive in being able to say, you could, don't have to wear a mask. You can go to certain, you know, you can be with loved ones. I don't know that actually, I do worry a lot about this differential um, for folks if we start, having access to other things, to services, to, to things that people consider to be, um, as you were saying, have it going, to a, going to a football game or something like that. Those kinds of things I'm less, uh, I would say I'm less supportive of simply because it may create bigger, bigger disparities than we already have. So only go, being able to go to school, for example, because you are vaccinated. Those kinds of disparities we don't, are, we don't need to exacerbate by having those who have vaccinated versus those who haven't. Yeah. All right, and last, last questions came in from one of our viewers. Uh, in addition to the right message and messenger, uh, what do you think about mediums, uh, whether it's, you know, is it best television, best internet, best in person, best in a, in a church, best in a, you know, a sporting event? How do you think about sort of what are the right places? I think, I think any and all is going to be necessary. Print, social media. Um, but I think partially it's also understanding different avenues are going to be important for different populations. I do research with young people. I would absolutely be on social media. I would be doing TikToks. I would be doing Instagram posts, those kinds of things. My, my dad's not gonna be looking at that, but he does look at the nightly news every night. So I would be messaging him via the nightly news. So I think that's a really good point. Who you wanna, depending on who you reach, the kind of medium for which your communication medium is gonna change would be targeted for that. Great. Thank you, Margaret, really appreciate that. And uh, it's very you. helpful it, it, as, as the evidence emerges about the disparities that we feared, uh, it's really gonna be important to attack this with all the tools that you've described. So thank you for, uh, for helping us understand that better. Let us bring on uh, Rob and Eric uh, for our last segment. And although uh, most of what I'd like to talk about with them is their experience with, uh, <clears throat> with the uh, Biden's uh, advisory board on COVID, uh, they are both you know, major figures in their own right in, 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 in their work. So I want to give them both a chance to talk a little bit about what they've heard so far. Rob, I know you've done a fair amount of work in thinking about vaccinations, particularly as it pertains to patients who get care in, through the emergency department. So why don't you spend a minute just talking to us about that? Yes, Bob. Uh, first, first of all, it's an honor to be on here with you. And uh, I thought Dr. Lightfoot's comments were outstanding. They really hit home. Uh, with some of the research that we're doing now in the emergency department, that as a background, there's a, a, a vulnerable population whose only, whose primary and only healthcare access occurs in emergency departments. And that includes homeless persons, undocumented immigrants, uninsured people, and African-Americans and Latinos get a disproportionate amount of their healthcare in emergency departments. So uh, what we're doing is a study in 15 emergency departments across the country, looking at the barriers that they have to getting a COVID-19 vaccine, especially looking at that issue of vaccine hesitancy. And we're, we've analyzed a, a half, half of our data so far. We'll, we'll be finished in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks. And we're finding that of people whose primary healthcare access occurs in the emergency department, 45% of them are vaccine hesitant. They, they say that they're not, uh, they don't wanna get uh, the vaccine even if it was offered to them for free. And uh, some of the reasons that they give are just what Dr. Lightfoot said. And a, a notable of those reasons is a, a general distrust in, in healthcare systems. So that's a little bit concerning. Of those who said that they would accept the vaccine uh, vaccine acceptors, 
two thirds of them said that they have no place to go to get the vaccine. They can't simply walk into a Walgreens and say, hey, can, can I get my vaccine? They, they just really are not used to accessing the system in that manner. And 94% of them said that they would accept it if it was offered to them in the emergency, emergency department. So what we're looking at is developing uh, trusted messaging programs, just like what Dr. Lightfoot said, trusting trusted messenger programs in the emergency department to, to, to get at that hard to reach community whose only healthcare access occurs in the emergency department to engender trust in getting the vaccine. And we're also looking at trying to establish ED, uh, COVID-19 ED-based vaccination programs that such that they can get the vaccine while they're there in the emergency department for their other care. Well, I, I, it probably goes without saying that if we can get the J&J through the pipeline and it's a single dose, that would be a heck of a lot easier than having them then come back again in a few weeks. Yeah, that, absolutely. The, the, the follow-up for, uh, you wouldn't have to get that second follow-up visit. And uh, yeah, that's what we're, that's what we're targeting. Right. Eric, let's turn to you. And I, you've had deeper experience in the world of HIV and, and maybe particularly the global world of HIV uh, than I think anybody I know. You and I used to practice together at San Francisco General in the, in the early, in the 80s. Uh, remember that fondly. Uh, tell us how you're processing this entire, it's too big a question, but sort of taking it in a couple of minutes, sort of uh, processing the pandemic from through the lens of what you've come to learn over the years about uh, about HIV. What, what are the lessons that you think are most salient? Yeah, thanks, Bob. Uh, it's a real honor to be with everybody today. Uh, and Monica and uh, Dr. Lightfoot's uh, presentations were really stimulating and impressive on all fronts. So thank you for that. Um, I think for me, the contrast has been looking at the um, similarities of presentation of the reaction by the medical delivery system and community to the outbreak of HIV versus COVID, uh, how uh, that uh, threat and challenge was responded to by those in the community that have a convening or orchestrating responsibility. Uh, and I was most impressed with um, how the same issues of, uh, of coordination and cooperation that were really defined in the early outbreak of HIV in San Francisco um, really were not as easily um, accessed because of the remarkable decentralization of healthcare that's occurred kind of in the, in the interim. Uh, the who's responsible for the public health response uh, versus the care of individuals, those insured, not insured, how you access resources to stand up testing and, um, and uh, vaccination efforts uh, has been a remarkable uh, deja vu and new challenge kind of juxtaposition. But the main thing, Bob, has been the um, how rapidly COVID has moved through all of the outbreak recognition quantification that that uh, leads to uh, mounting uh, a geo kind of mapping of it and then following that with a response that continues to identify populations at highest risk and ensure their access and retention. Uh, this did it all in an abbreviated period of time. It took, you know, the, the half-life of 10 years for HIV in developed settings, I think, made this a very different um, cadence. But, uh, but those were the similarities I kept seeing one after the other. Thank you. Let's turn to the, uh, your experience with the, the, the uh, president-elect's group, groups. I know you're still involved in some advising there just maybe just take us through <laughs> would have been nice to be a fly on the wall you know what did you learn being on the inside that surprised you that you didn't know before give us your impressions of 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 the experience of being on uh, as part of that uh, amazing group uh, rob why don't you start yeah bob so we each had different experience and ideas that we brought to the table and uh those that experience kind of 
put us into different groups of, as to the issues that we were addressing and the stakeholders that we were reaching out to. I'm an emergency physician, critical care physician, and my goals, I had sort of three goals. I'm a, as a frontline provider, I wanted to look into advocating for frontline providers, especially as especially in terms of the impact the impact of the pandemic on the mental health of frontline providers. That's a huge topic for us. Um, so I, I met with American College of Emergency Physicians, with EMS agencies and firefighters, and brought uh, their messages back to to. The transition team. Um, second, I'm Latino, and uh, we all know that the pandemic has really hit the Latino community really, really hard. So I engaged with uh, members of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus with LULAC and uh, with the Unidos, Unidos US, which used to be La Raza, and uh, was trying and uh, groups that in, uh, companies that employ large numbers of Latinos, like meat packing or uh, meat packing companies, and try to uh, try to bring their needs uh, back to them. And then my third point of emphasis or advocacy was toward under-resourced communities. Uh, I I went down to to my hometown of Brownsville, Texas, to help out with a surge in the COVID nineteen pandemic down there, and uh, Brownsville as a background is one of the poorest or second poorest per capita uh, community in the country. And that, um, that really uh, uh, hit home to me about how difficult it is to uh, take care of, deal with the pandemic in under-resourced hospitals. You know, typically when I'm attending in the ICU at, at, at my home hospitals here at the, at the general and in the ICU at, at Highland, you know, I have a, a big team of, of physicians that uh, residents and others that can help deal with the patients down there. Uh, we were dealing with we we're, were operating solo, dealing with 10 times the number of, of critically ill COVID patients. And so um, I was was trying to advocate for new programs of assistance for those under resourced hotspots theme, the current FEMA. FEMA program. It's not really FEMA is not really designed to, for for a pandemic response. You know, it's really designed to to hit regional areas like a big. It's designed to hit to address hurricanes and things like things like that. Um, and so FEMA really plods too slowly to get to all these under resourced communities to all these hotspots. And so it, it, you know, by the time FEMA got down to Brownsville, it was too late. It was the cat was out of the bag. So what I was advocating for is is the development of uh, strike forces of teams of physicians and, and and nurses and other staff that can mobilize quickly, can kind of nimble teams that can be mobilized to to, to hotspots. So uh, those were the the kinds of things that I uh, was was trying to do on the task force. And did you find that uh, you got traction? Uh, yeah, th there was pr pretty good response to, to all of those. But one of, one of the things that I learned, and I, I'd say the, the biggest thing that I learned from this is that um, there's uh, that it's really difficult to balance the needs and, and desires of, of various constituencies and that are comp keep competing for limited resources in the pandemic. Um, you, you know, the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine, vaccines are a prime example of that. Uh, there number of the, met with a number of stakeholders, to each who said, who really wanted to get the vaccine for their constituents. They wanted to be moved up in priority. Um, they wanted to be put into the 1A or the 1B, 1B categories. Um, but uh, there's a limited supply of vaccine. And so if, um, so if you were to do that, you're going to have to bump another constituent off the table. Yeah, yeah. Clearly, the trade-offs are, are become very obvious. Eric, what was your? You've, you've, unlike Rob, you've done a lot of federal and and WHO international work. What was your impression of this particular uh, group and and how it was being organized? How the president and the vice president were managing it, and and uh, 
Uh, just how did, how did it all work out from your perspective? Yeah, uh, thanks. R Robert and I had, did have different experiences. I, I was uh, engaged in the discussions that um, focused on the immediate kind of city level and state level um, responses um, and the um, looking at disparities in outcomes for hospitalization, for number of cases, hospitalization, transfer to unit, intubation and death, uh, having a predominance in minority populations. I was in, in those discussions. And uh, the, the other was uh, reorganization of kind of global health programs in the State Department in USAID um, and CDC to some extent. Uh, and it would basically take the issue uh, in question that the, um, that the transition group had been working on really since the summer and bring it to a smaller group on the advisory committee that would react to it and go back and forth, ask for more information, and then formulate a policy decision focused on really the first 100-day executive order uh, challenge that um, the Biden-Harris administration came out with in the first couple of days, all the executive orders. Most of the issues I uh, focused on, except for the COVID specific, were really um, not a hundred day priority. So I had an, a, a, a different in and out. I met about 70 different groups in meeting with them as Robert did, talking uh, to constituents constituency groups that basically were lobbying for their constituencies to the Biden-Harris uh, administration at large um, with kind of a very uh, broad array of requests. Uh, and what I found was uh, the, um, the fact that the COVID outbreak had re-emphasized uh, disparities that run down minority and socioeconomic lanes as usual, as always, uh, were highlighted again in COVID. And the discussion around these disparities really presented an opportunity to the Biden administration to embrace a broader um, uh, engagement around access and retention for minor minority communities at a more basic level than just a pandemic COVID outbreak. So much of my discussion was how can we uh, take these um, sustained disparities in COVID and any other disease you want to name and change the way we make federal programs go down to local programs in terms of how the money gets to program and how does it get to those high risk groups effectively, which is always the challenge. So that was the kind of level of back and forth for me. The other big area of discussion, I'll just say briefly, and I mentioned it before, was the impact that decentralized healthcare had on the planning at the local level. And what can we do to improve that? And how much uh, was, were your discussions influenced by the fact that, you, that A, you were getting no handoff from the Trump administration, which at that point had not admitted that they had lost, and, uh, and B, it wasn't like things had gone well as a set of policy responses in the past year. So you had to kind of establish, reestablish, mostly establish trust. So how, how, how influential was that as compared to sort of a mythical world where you'd, you'd gotten a handoff that was really good and things had been going about as good as they could go? Maybe Eric, take that first and see if- Yeah, I'll take it first. Uh, it's, it, it is kind of the point, isn't it? I, I, I apologize for not, uh, engaging that. Um, I've been through two other transitions. So this is the third transition I've been through. The normal transition is two to three months of preparation for an agency to prepare a briefing book that covers all of the salient issues, the problem issues, detailed budget analysis, and what does that first six month trajectory look like from the current manager's perspective. So there's an understanding of where you were in the moment. None of that occurred. And uh, a booklet was not made. A, they didn't say there wasn't gonna be a booklet. There was no discussion around, uh, yeah, we've been told not to engage with you, uh, which is the behavior we saw, but we weren't told that they were told not to engage with us. 
I have relationships that go back 30 years with people under the political layer in all of these agencies, and they were still muzzled even after the election. So it was a remarkable kind of uh, uh, evolution of understanding of just where we were in this lack of dialogue. And and not, not to criticize, I understand it completely, but the Biden uh, campaign uh, suddenly moving into a governance mode, which is a very different orientation, uh, were kind of stuck in reacting to the Trump behavior in the kind of specifics of the transition as if they were still in a campaign and wanting to, uh, you know, pick and choose their fights, decide what they're going to open up or not open up, uh, and, as opposed to just calling foul, which took forever. Uh, and um, so I was frustrated in it. But how much did that, how much did that, more, how much did that set you back? Yeah. How much did that set you back, Eric? Uh, our discussion really uh, did not occur in, in any kind of specifics until uh, after the 20th. And then there was a scramble for what are the uh, big salient issues. And right now they are still accruing an understanding of where they are in real time with all of the major programs. It has slowed up some decision-making on positions, uh, but nothing, nothing that we won't recover from, nothing for us to be too concerned about. So, Rob, anything to add about that, about the transition? Yeah, it was that, that part of it caught me as a, it was a big surprise and, and actually extremely uh, disappointing uh, that the uh, prior administration would, uh, would do that. Um, it, it, uh, I wasn't as, as deeply involved as Dr. Goosby was in, in, in matters that pertain to, to uh, getting that information, but um, I did have some dif difficult experiences in terms of us trying to get some information from, from FEMA and from uh, the um, other directors of national disaster response teams. And um, yeah, I was just blocked. So I, 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 I like others, had to kind of use back channels, you know, people that I knew, knew from other uh, research and, and professors at, at uh, other institutions that um, would talk to me, but it felt very cloak and dagger like, uh, you know, they, they were, they were, they were, some of them were truly uh, afraid to to talk to us. I think there were real repercussions for people who, who broke ranks. Yeah, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Uh, maybe last, uh, last question, just sort of, uh, what were your impressions of the administration and of, and, and of the president? Uh, and, and as you've now watched a month of real life and, and, and the Biden administration hitting the ground and trying to get on top of this, how do you think it's going? And I'll start, I'll start with Rob on that one and end with Eric. Well, uh, I thought it was, I thought they were tremendous. I mean, the, we had limited interaction with the president and the vice president, and, uh, but the, the one meeting that they attended, they were, they were asking incredibly insightful questions, um, really spot on. They, they knew what they were talking about. And, uh, so I was very impressed. Um, and I, you know, I have to say that, uh, it's nice just the whole whole change in attitude of somebody listening to science um, was is is very clear, and uh, I'm extremely optimistic. I think um, I think they're doing uh, an outstanding job. Eric, thank you. I would uh, echo Robert's uh, statements. Um, I think we have. Um, uh, in President Biden, uh, someone who understands the difference uh, that governance mean what governance means, uh, that it's not uh, the elements that we generally attribute to politicians, but it's the ability to take responsibility for uh, the good and bad of the outcomes for the population that you are president for, for our population. And he really understands that he needs to understand uh, those, uh, the entire spectrum of those with and those without. Uh, he has a deep appreciation for that. That's amplified by Vice President Harris's uh, lifelong attention to disparities, 
uh, and inequities that run down both racial and socioeconomic lines. Her main claim uh, to um, uh, her, the main issues that I spoke to her about were all around issues of equity. How do we incorporate uh, and target populations that historically have not accessed uh, federal dollars, uh, both uh, at the city and state level? Uh, what is the relevant or irrelevant activity that things like HUD are or are not doing now? Are there reforms that have racial agendas to them? She, she brought all of those up spontaneously, which is unusual, uh, but which just speaks to how uh, they are prioritized in both of their minds. So I, I remain optimistic that this will be an attempt to pivot into a relationship with uh, equal playing fields uh, in our society that focus on health and education, that until those playing fields are equal, that the federal government has a, a needs to have an aggressive role in, uh, in uh, understanding the inequitable manifestations of that unequal playing field. And they are laser focused on it in a way that I haven't heard before. Right. So right. Well, let me thank you both for coming on today and thank you for your service and for representing us so spectacularly well uh, and, and sharing your experiences with us. Uh, really grateful to both of you for, for all of that. Thanks so much. So let's go ahead and uh, end an upcoming uh, session. Yet another member of the Biden group, uh, the Biden advisory group uh, will be on next week. And that's a special Grand Rounds, a little bit of out of order, but uh, you'll see for a reason, uh, Atul Gawande, who is, uh, uh, I think everybody knows Atul, the author of four best-selling books, a writer for The New Yorker, a surgeon, uh, recently ran the uh, company uh, Haven um, and was on the, uh, the advisory group for, uh, for the Biden administration, will be our speaker next week. It's a special session. It's, it's the Reza Ganji Memorial Lecture where we focus on issues that Reza, one of our former residents, was passionate about. And those issues tend to be policy and uh, ethics and equity. So that seems like a perfect fit. So Atul will be on as the sole guest uh, next week and really excited to have, uh, to have him. So please join us uh, then for that. You see our amazing production team up there, Alyssa, Lisa, Serena, Kyle, and John. They put these on uh, every week uh, flawlessly. And thank you to all of you for uh, joining us. And thanks to our uh, wonderful speakers. Stay safe and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.